In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. Welcome all of you as we gather this afternoon for this time when we pray for Anna and the family. Every time when we gather for a funeral, you know, we renew our trust in the Lord Jesus, the one who said, you know, even though you die, you will live. So if we believe in God, if we have our eyes fixed on him, it's not about being perfect. None of us is. But we believe in God, and he loves us tremendously. He accompanies us in every step that we take in life. But the most important is that when we make that step, you know, through death, he is right there to meet us, to bring us to his the place that he prepared for us. So we renew our trust in Lord Jesus, the one who, by his death and resurrection, opened the gates of heaven for us. So let us bring our hearts to him as we pray for Anna and also for ourselves who still continue uh, the journey on this earth. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father, it is our certain faith that your son who died on the cross was raised from the dead, the first fruits of all who have fallen asleep. Grant that through this mystery, your servant Anna, who has gone to her rest in Christ, may share in the joy of his resurrection. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings, and I invite the first reader, please come up. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim, proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, and to give them a garland instead of ashes, an oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of faint spirit, the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Our response will be, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord, Lord is, is shepherd, shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. The, the Lord, Lord is, is my shepherd, shepherd I, I shall not want. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, and everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, 
may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary infliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what is, tempor what is seen is temporary, and what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. On the first day of the week, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about 11 kilometers from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. These were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. Each of us has a story to tell, namely the story of our lives. And every story is, deserves to be listened to and with respect. Sadly, all our stories end in death. And it is not bad if the death comes naturally after a long life. But sometimes that story is being abrupted. And maybe sometimes even is a kind of a promising one, but kind of finishes too early. The person, the day the person dies, we begin to, to see the story, to hear the story, to tell the stories. Because our life is like that book that we keep writing. And it has many pages, many chapters, but then when, and many of those stories are not that known. But the day the person dies, that book is like open for everyone to read. And then closer we are with the loved one, with the person who dies, we will read the stories with more details. Others will come to know maybe different chapters, that pages that they haven't known about before. The day that the person dies, we begin to tell the stories. And it just passes before in front of our eyes, you know, that story of the person. And it is laid open, laid out before, before everyone, with all the joys and sorrows, successes, failures, everything we find in that story. We have all suffered a great loss, but especially Anna's you know, family. 
And we know how, when we hear the story of the disciples today, we can kind of understand more how those two disciples felt when the story about Jesus, the story that was so promising, kind of ended the way that they were never thought. And what is more interesting is that the death of Jesus, the suffering and death, which they thought was the horrible end of the story, became the means of the new hope of the, of the, of the continuation of the story. Because it is through the death and, and the resurrection then the resurrection, Jesus shows that that's not the end of the story. The story continues in a most beautiful, beautiful and remarkable way that St. Paul, talking about in today's second reading, said everything what we have on this earth, we can see, we can touch, is temporary, will pass away. But something that is unseen, this is eternal, something that we, it's hard even to explain. And that's what he says in other places. What God has prepared for us, for those who love him, we cannot, we cannot imagine. The eyes have not seen what God has prepared for those who love him. That's our story as Christians. That's our story because this is only part of the story that will sooner or later will end. But then we continue that story, we have to go through the death. And we know that Jesus, the one who conquered the death, uh, he will meet us there to lead us safely over the, the, the death. You know, this is the experience, our common experience as human beings, because death is the, we can say, the biggest crisis for us as humans um, in our existence on this earth. Something that we cannot avoid, we have to all go through. But first of all, before we go ourselves, we experience the loved ones who go through that. And we experience that kind of separation. And even though we know our faith tells us this is only temporary, we will meet again. It's still sad. You know, and then uh, this kind of darkness that we experience, when we put in the perspective of our faith, that's when we see light. Because for those disciples who are walking today, they are discussing with each other about that darkest time for them. They put all their hopes in Jesus. They thought that he was the Messiah and he was crucified. He died. But in these darkest moments, the light comes. He himself joins them, explains to them, tries to help them to understand the scripture, the, all the prophecies or so, and then they recognize him. Imagine just from that human perspective, these 11 kilometers that they made, they go back, they couldn't hold, they couldn't sleep, they couldn't hold this story, this, this, this light that came to them. They go and share with the rest of the disciples. We've seen him. He truly is risen. The same for us. Whether it's a death of a loved one, whatever darkest moments we go through, God with his light is awaiting for us. But what happens is that we have to be open to that light. Because the disciples were open to that stranger who was Jesus, joined them on the road and helped them to understand the story and see the future story. For us too, we can be so closed and not be able to, you know, do that in God's light in our lives, which comes from different places, or we can be open and then God will gently lead us through any kind of darkness into the light. It's a strange way, but sometimes death brings us closer to God uh, because he is the one who is victorious, the triumphant. But that was God's plan. We heard that in the first reading, centuries before Jesus came. People have no idea of the eternity and kind of resurrection. Of course, they believe in God that was eternal. And he says, he will come, Messiah will come to bring freedom, to bring the good news. This is the good news for us. That even though we are separated, we experience death, that's not the end of the story because our story will continue into eternity, because Jesus paid the price with his life uh, for, for this. We gather here to give thanks to God for 94 years of Anna and many blessings that we receive from God through her in many ways. As, um, you know, hearing the story of 
Paul, when Paul says, and helps us to, to, to understand, we have to leave everything behind. What we have is temporary. We live in a like, kind of tent, but then we have permanent place that is called heaven, made by God. And we have to leave everything and move to that permanent place. So in that sense, we, every time when we kind of move from one place to another, when we move from one phase to another in life, we kind of die a little bit, but only to be born to something new. And that's kind of experience, common experience for us. Thinking of that, I, mom came from Hungary, had to leave everything behind, um, and all those changes, you know, next phase, next place to live, next, you know, place, uh, new people. So we let go of something, we are welcoming something new. That helps us to grow, but also help us to prepare, don't hold on to every, what is on this earth, because we have to leave everything behind. What good, what we have done, whom we have become, over the years, that's what matters. So we give thanks to God for everything, all the blessings that God have given us through her. And uh, we know how generous and supportive and understanding she was in life. Um, that's who God is. God is all that merciful and kind. It's like what we heard in the psalm. Like that good shepherd who will lead the sheep to green pasture, that they can be satisfied. God does so in this life, but also more so, he is preparing for us something beautiful in heaven. So we believe that God went there, that Anna went there to meet God. We will follow her. So, but when we go through this temporary separation, we can still maintain that bond of love with her, uh, because the love is stronger than death. Amen. Please stand as we bring to God our prayers and our intentions. God, the Almighty Father, raised Christ, his Son, from the dead. With confidence, we ask him to save all his people living and dead. Our response will be, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For Anna, who in baptism was given the pledge of eternal life, that she may now be admitted to the company of the saints, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For Anna, who ate the body of Christ, the bread of life, that she may be raised up on the last day, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our deceased relatives and friends, and for all who have helped us, that they may have the reward of their goodness, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all of us assembled here to worship in faith, that we may be gathered again in God's kingdom, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray the Lord, sorry. Um, for caregivers everywhere, that they may continue to express in action the support and the love of God, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. The family and the friends of Anna seek comfort and consolation. Heal their pain and dispel the darkness and the doubt that come with grief, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. God, our shelter and our strength, you listen in love to the cry of your people. Hear the prayers we offer for our departed brothers and sisters. Cleanse them of their sins and grant them the fullness of redemption. We ask this through Christ our Lord. With longing for the coming of God's kingdom, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Before we go our separate ways, let us take leave of our sister. May our farewell express our affection for her. May it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope. One day we shall joyfully greet her again when the love of Christ, which conquers all things, destroys even death itself. 
in baptism and assured in the death and resurrection of Christ, may she be welcomed into the glory of eternal life. To you, o Lord, we commend the soul of Anna, your servant. In the sight of this world, she is now dead. In your sight, may she live forever. Forgive whatever sins she committed through human weakness, and in your goodness, grant her everlasting peace. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear friends, may every mark of affection and every gesture of friendship that you show to others be a sign of God's peace for you. In peace, let us take in peace and in the sure hope of the resurrection, we take leave of our sister, knowing that one day we shall be with her in heaven. When I think of my Oma, I think of my mom, my dad, and my sister piling into our dusty gray-green Honda Odyssey the morning after Christmas Day. We drive down the icy Alberta roads, our bellies rumbling, listening to Christmas carols and counting down every minute of the drive. Then we pull up to a perfectly shoveled, arrow-straight walkway, and we had arrived. The door is already open for us as we rush in from the cold. Our arms are empty. Everything is ready, there's nothing for us to bring. Usually, Oma appears, apron clad at the top of the stairs as the mouth-watering aromas of garlic, roast chicken, and mashed potatoes drift down over the landing. Other times, we just hear her voice as she greets us over the beeping of the microwave oven or the sound of German music. We walk up the stairs of her cozy, perfectly kept home. Opa gives me a warm pat on the back as we are ushered into the dining room. Everything is ready, everything is perfect. The polished silverware is in its place, the corningware overflowing with countless courses, red cabbage, herb roasted chicken, creamy mashed potatoes, cucumber salad, and best of all, a strawberry trifle so steeped in Grand Marnier you can smell it in the next room. As we sit at the table, calling for Opa, Oma, who is still buzzing around the kitchen, perfecting this detail or that, eat, she, call, she calls in, while it's warm, a command echoed immediately by Opa. So we do, and everything is delicious. It is natural for us, her family, to remember Mum in her comfortable home. However, she faced many hardships, and her inspiring story is one of adventure and courage. Anna was born in Nagakovachi, Hungary not far from Budapest, in January 1927. She was the youngest of three daughters and also had a younger brother. Her childhood centered around the farm, her community, the church, and music. Although Mum's family had lived in Hungary for three generations, they were forced to leave their home in 1946 when their homeland fell under the communist regime. Despite this devastating hardship, the family found the courage and resiliency to start a new life in West Germany. Jobs were scarce, but Anna, at 19, found a job in Mannheim working as a nanny and housekeeper. She worked for a lovely family and enjoyed the work, but knew she wanted more out of life. In 1953, Anna bravely asserted her independence 
accepted a contract to work in a Canadian household, and boarded a ship alone for a two-week ocean crossing, unsure of when, if ever, she would see her family again. After the voyage and a long train journey from Montreal, Anna disembarked in Edmonton, the city that would become her home for the rest of her life. The first few months in English-speaking Canada were difficult, but soon Anna met Tony in a European cafe on 97th Street, and they married in 1955. Together they worked hard to preserve their heritage and build their life as a Canadian family. Mum's courageous approach to life continued during her early years in Edmonton, and she never shied away from unfamiliar tasks or opportunities. She continuously sought to improve herself and her life. Mum taught herself English by speaking with others and reading the Edmonton Journal. She worked evenings and nights in various jobs before finding a fulfilling role at the Royal Alexandra Hospital in food services. No matter where she worked, Mum applied an impeccable work ethic and commitment to high quality outcomes. Any job worth doing was worth doing well. The courage to embrace new experiences and learn new skills is a trait that Mum would also apply to daily life. I fondly remember mother-daughter night at school where Mum played floor hockey for the first time ever alongside all the other mothers in the school gym. She also attended a pioneer field trip with my grade three class, where she took on the task of helping the children churn cream to make ice cream. Three turns to mix the cream for each child and 10 forceful churns for mom. Her diligence and strong right arm allowed all the children to have a taste of homemade ice cream that day. Oma and mom have a shared love of ice cream and exercise. Oma loved walking in particular. When babysitting her infant granddaughters, Oma made sure to bundle them up in the stroller in all but the coldest weather and go for a long neighborhood stroll each day. The girls had a fresh air nap and Oma got to walk at her speedy pace that she maintained until her 90s. Oma was certainly capable of getting her driver's license, but made a conscious choice early on not to, in favor of walking or busing around Edmonton. In this way, she was also able to support Opa's role as the family chauffeur. Oma loved music. As a young girl, music was an important part of her life. At home in Hungary, Oma's family was very musical, with both her father and her grandfather receiving musical training in Vienna. Oma's father, Josef Zemel, was the leader of the community's band, which would perform at all the local celebrations. She sang in the choir at church and continued to love singing at mass every Sunday. She had a very deep and private connection to her faith. During the Christmas season, Silent Night would often be her favorite tune to practice her lovely alto voice. Everyone who knew Oma over the past few years Anyone who knew Oma over the past few years knows that Bavarian music was guaranteed to make her eyes sparkle her hands wave, and her feet start tapping. She also loved to dance, but more recently preferred to twirl around in her living room solo. Oma loved to be organized. She ran the household with efficiency, always made constructive use of her time, and prided herself on a neat and tidy environment where everything was in its place and well cared for. This did not only apply to her possessions. House guests would sometimes find that if they stayed overnight, their shoes would somehow appear shiny and new and neatly arranged by morning. In this way, Oma showed her love and appreciation for others through her gifts of time and her gifts of service. 
Food was an essential part of any social gathering with Oma. Betty's childhood birthday parties frequently had at least six desserts to choose from, beautiful table settings, and good china. That is, until little Susie broke a bowl. When Betty met Pat and her family grew, Oma regularly sent Pat care packages filled with lunches, dinners, and snacks. And at coin gatherings, Oma, as she became known to everyone, always brought enormous trays of Christmas cookies. On special occasions, the granddaughters were invited to help by decorating cookies or filling dumplings, but everyone knew that Oma was in charge of quality control. Oma was also an extremely talented seamstress and creator, as we can see here. She sewed, knitted, did needlework, and once tried to quilt along with the coin ladies. All of our homes have several of Oma's beautiful crocheted blankets. This is something she initially tried to pass on to Betty, whose stitches were far too tight, but it did skip a generation when she taught Shannon how to crochet little Santas for the Christmas tree. <coughs> of course, most of Oma's decorations were homemade, from needlepoint pictures, pillowcases, and even the curtains. She always made the best of what she had available to her. Oma and Opa did not have a disposable mindset. If something ripped, Oma sewed it. If something broke, Opa fixed it. If something could be made, they wouldn't buy it. Oma taught herself to sew, and most of the dresses she wore were homemade. In fact, Oma also sewed all of Betty's clothing until around junior high when a teenage Betty put her foot down in favor of buying cool clothes. Lisa and I also wore our fair share of beautiful Oma dresses when we were little too. Whether she was baking, crocheting, or sewing, these acts of service were a true labor of love. This was Oma's quiet way. Nourishing her family was always her priority. Even when money was tight, she saved to be able to do things that were important to her, like sitting for professional wedding photographs and traveling back to Germany a few times to visit her family. <laughs> when Betty was born, Oma stayed home to raise her while still working evenings. Oma and Opa were also deeply committed to their daughter's and granddaughter's educations. Though she herself did not have the opportunity, Oma understood the value of education and wanted this for her girls. Mom never focused on what she was missing. Instead, she focused on what she had. She viewed life with a cup half full attitude and was happiest when she was busy helping and caring for those around her. Mom was a positive, happy woman who enjoyed all that life had to offer. Even through the difficulties of Alzheimer's the past few years, Mom stayed true to her pleasant nature. Her caregiver friends kept Oma smiling and laughing filling her days with baking, walking, and music. For this, we will always be so very grateful. Oma's joy, talent, courage, and generosity will forever be remembered. We know that you are up there dancing and singing with the angels right now. We love you forever, Oma. <laughs>